Uh, hey, so uh, normally the big picture doesn't have like live action parts, but we were going to put this explainer bit that you're gonna see next up in the middle of Tuesday's show about whether or not it's possible the CW Crisis on Infinite Earths miniseries is gonna be used to do housekeeping, like deleting the poorly received movies and plot turns Warner Brothers would rather move on from out of the DC Extended Universe canon. You know, the same way the original comic was as a way of making the episode shorter, but it actually ended up having the opposite intended effect, so I cut it out. But then also, like, we did shoot the footage and did all this green screen compositing, and like in my business, the sunk cost fallacy is just called the cost, so uh, yeah, roll that clip. Okay, let's do this one more time. The 1930s and 40s, the golden age of comics. DC superheroes have one continuity, sort of, loosely. They hang out sometimes. It's there. The 1950s, superheroes aren't popular for a while. Comics go in another direction. DC stopped publishing everyone except Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman because they've become really popular in media outside of comics, and also if they stopped, they might have to give some of the rights back to some of the creators, and they don't want to do that. The 1960s, the Silver Age. Superheroes get popular again. DC makes fancy new versions of characters like Flash and Green Lantern, grounded more in science fiction than pulp fantasy, and unrelated to the originals apart from the names because it's been like a decade and the main audience for these books aren't generally expected to still be following them once they discovered, you know, sex. But as a nod to the longtime fans who did stick around, the creators of the new Flash put in a cute detail to his origin story wherein he picks his name and costume as a tribute to the Golden Age Flash comic books because he's a fan of old comics and they had the same power set. Devout comic book fans reacted to this subtle yet sincere acknowledgement of appreciation to their loyal patronage from hardworking creative staff as you might expect they complained about it. How can the original Flash have been fictional if he interacted with Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and their stories are still ongoing and reference the events that took place at the same time they knew the Flash? Also, all of those stories took place during and before World War II, yet the characters don't seem to have aged out of their mid-30s. I'm afraid I'm beginning to find some holes in your hastily composed weekly science fiction and fantasy hybrid cartoon fiction for young children, sirs. <clears throat> so they fixed this, possibly having planned to do so all along, depending on who you ask and in what era, with a story wherein it turned out that the World War II Golden Age era versions of the DC heroes and their comic book adventures had existed just in an alternate universe called Earth 2, where everyone's origin had started a little bit earlier, and that Earth 1 comic book writers had somehow tapped into knowledge-wise on a subconscious level in their dreams. Sure, that yeah, makes sense. You know, like, good enough. This soon allowed Silver Age heroes to meet up with older Golden Age counterparts for occasional adventures and gave writers a whole alternate timeline playground to try out ideas like, what if Batman and Catwoman had a daughter? What if there was a third Earth where the good guys were bad and the bad guys were good? What if Supergirl had, like, way, way bigger opinions. Now eventually this Infinite Earths conceit became DC's preferred method of dumping whole stables of obscure characters snapped up from other defunct publishers into their universe, featuring them in yearly Justice League crossover team-up events usually called Crisis This or On That and setting entire books on one or more alternate timelines. Many fans dug it, some found it confusing. So... 1985 to 1986, The Crisis on Infinite Earths, a year-long superhero cosmic crossover nonsense megaseries of absurdity by which all other are still judged. A big scary dude tries to destroy every universe ever, and every hero, villain, every thing fights a great big space-time war about it. Supergirl and The Flash both get killed, so they know you're not fucking around. And in the end, all of reality is collapsed into a single reordered timeline. Almost every redundant character got erased from existence except for Power Girl, because for some reason they really liked drawing her. And for the next 30 years of similar big DC events, they wound up all being about whether or not any of the pre-crisis stuff could come back, how much of it could, how that might happen, whether or not that's a good idea, different ways of doing or undoing a new crisis, and if so, what might be behind it, and in the most recent iteration, it all turned out to be fault. Which I'm sure had absolutely nothing to do with Alan Moore finally saying, fuck it, I'm done. Okay, so uh, now that we have room to flesh this out a bit more, uh, an up-to-date sense, we now return you to the much more pleasant-looking version of the big picture. Okay, I do not want this to end up as long as the last one, so let's make this snappy. So you might assume that if DC was going to reboot their entire universe of endlessly malleable possibilities into a single rigid cohesive thing with Crisis on Infinite Earths, there would have been a plan already worked out in detail as to what the new DC universe was actually going to be and how it would work. 
unless you've seen one of these shows before or like read a DC comic within the last 20 years, in which case you know that was not the case. The post-crisis DC universe was in fact an uneven mess right out of the gate. Not all of the books were bad, not all of them were good either, but they just really couldn't keep what was still canon totally straight. Different writers and editors took different opportunities to use the crisis as a leeway to make different retroactive changes to mythology and characters. There were reboots of varying quality, hip and edgy series starring new characters introduced during Crisis, kind of flopped in an ambitious attempt to shake up the Justice League by having it disband and reform as a team of mostly hip, street-smart teenage heroes with attitude based in downtown Detroit was about as good as that sounds. Things got sort of righted with the next big crossover event, Legends, which brought Darkseid and Jack Kirby's new gods back to the forefront of things, revived Shazam and company for the first time in the post-crisis era, made the Justice League not suck again for a pretty good long time, and introduced the Suicide Squad. 1991's Armageddon 2001 was supposed to be a mystery about which hero would go insane and become a time-traveling supervillain called Monarch, but when someone leaked the reveal early, they changed the identity to one that made no sense and created a logic problem that a bunch of later event books would bend over backwards trying to fix. No, really, this just kept happening. I'm, I'm not even going to do the line, folks. It's beside the point. I think you get it. 1992's Death of Superman, of course, is the one everyone's probably heard of. Now, the storyline here didn't just sort of but not really kill the Man of Steel. It also very much really killed Green Lantern Hal Jordan's entire hometown, which eventually made him turn into a bad guy, which touched off a bunch of stuff that happened right after this. In fact, you might just want to pause and drink some water or something because 1994 is when this all just gets stupid. Okay, 1994, zero hour. Okay, so by this point, there'd been a bunch of little beats here and there where this or that person would remember something they shouldn't and try to undo the crisis and bring back the multiverse or a lost loved one or something, and this is the first time it's the plot of a whole event series. Hal Jordan, now called Parallax, tries to unreboot the universe. He fails, but not before causing a bunch of weird timeline stuff that was supposed to fix post-crisis continuity problems, but just made everything worse, and also Green Lantern fans were mad as hell about Hal turning evil and kind of stayed mad as hell, like, forever, even as Hal eventually redeemed himself with a kamikaze Earth Rescue suicide move in 1997's big event, The Final Night, which, apart from that, is actually one of the better ones of these. It's kind of like a superheroes versus disaster movie thing, as opposed to, like, a fight the villains kind of thing. Anyway, this allowed him to become the new Spectre in 1999's Day of Judgment. 2004, there came a book called Identity Crisis, which, despite the title, which was more of a locked room murder mystery, but with superheroes than another big time reshaping thing, but it led to stuff like that by setting off a chain reaction action that make all the characters really dark for a while storylines that ran through all the regular books, a set of build-up miniseries titled Day of Vengeance, Villains United, The Ran Thanagar War, and the one-shot Countdown to Infinite Crisis, and the big payoff... 2005's Infinite Crisis, which is an actual sequel to Crisis on Infinite Earths. Short version, a thing I didn't mention back at the start was that Earth 2's version of Superman and Lois Lane, the son of the good guy version of Lex Luthor and Superboy Prime, who's technically supposed to be from the real comic book reader universe, don't ask, were all able to survive the Crisis on Infinite Earths in a pocket universe, and in Infinite Crisis, they came back. But instead of being here to save the day, it turned out Superboy Prime and Luthor had gone crazy, and they wanted to blow up the universe to try to recreate the multiverse. In the end, the multiverse did sort of come back, but mostly everyone just remembered their pre-crisis backstories, sort of. Either way, in 2011, they blew it all up again with Flashpoint, which created a totally new Reset to Zero DC Universe called The New 52, and since this is the point where, like, half of the books anyone cares about started to be written and drawn by big-name superstar teams with an it'll-be-out-when-I-say-it's-done kind of deal, not even the company could be bothered to keep what's canon and what's not week-to-week -week anymore, but this experiment bumbled around, adding stuff that it just deleted back in piecemeal until 2015's Rebirth event, in which, once again, the DC heroes begin to suspect that pieces of their memories and history have been altered or removed, which, uh, looking back, kind of feels like it's just an average Tuesday kind of thing for them, which in turn led to Batman investigating and discovering the Comedian's Badge from Watchmen. Yeah, they, they finally did that one. With the subsequent and now still running, because delays, Doomsday Clock event series pulling the story into the DC continuity and establishing that Dr. Manhattan is apparently the one responsible for the timeline changes of the New 52, and promising to recreate an entirely new universe once again that will last for however long they need it to. And somehow, folks, they wonder why these things have all been more popular as movies, cartoons, and TV shows for the last 30 years. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.